Welcome to an incredibly hot sunset safari. It is a sweltering 41 degrees, 102 Fahrenheit. We are sitting at Philemon's Dip. Now, you're wondering why the first thing I'm going to show you on tonight's sunset safari is a drain pipe. There we can see the drain pipe. And as Vim, who's on camera with me today, zooms in on the drain pipe, my name is Brent Yeo Smith and Scott Dyson and Dave are out in the other vehicle. We have Kirsten and Nicola in final control, and this is Safari Live. Now, since I've been a tumor, I've seen leopards in some very strange places, but VM is going to show you there's a leopard in the hole under the road. Isn't that incredible? It is so blisteringly hot that Tandy has decided the coolest place to be is in the drain pipe. And as you can see, quite difficult to get a decent shot of it. There she is. So we apologize for the overexposure. But there we go. There's Tundi under the road. So when we first came looking for her, we actually drove over her. Can you believe that? We drove over the road, searching for these leopards. At, this is the area where James left them on the sunrise safari. And we were hoping to find them. And so what happened is, I drove off to the side and I parked. I said, Viam, I'm just going to go take a little walk. And literally, as I stepped out, Viam is, you can get back in the car, the leopard's behind us. So as we, I decided to go try to see where I could see them, she popped out, out of the drain pipe, walked over to some shade that we were going to go to next, and found Tingana. And so they're lying up separately from each other because of this heat. And I can tell you, it's quite uncomfortable at the moment, the heat that we're experiencing. Hold on. So I have to jump back up the little ridge here. And I make it, Vim. I nearly impaled Vim on a Tomburti tree. Sorry about that, Vim. I nearly made a society. Now, a society, for those of you who are not sure, is a very South African saying. It's basically uh, a South African word for a kebab. Can you make it? So, give me one second. Whoops, no, not quite there yet. We're going to be there in a couple of seconds. We're going to make it through them. There we go. So, Tingana's lying in a little bit more pleasant spot to be viewed. shade possible. He's probably a bit big uh, to fit in that particular drain pipe. And there he is. He's got a nice full belly lying up in the shade. A little thicket on the edge of the mall or the little river system at Philemon's Dip. On average, mating pairs of leopards will normally mate every 15 minutes, but in this heat, they might take a little bit longer. So apparently, there are already some awesome screenshots of a Tandy hiding in the drain pipe. Now, in other places, I've seen caracal in drain pipes, I've seen warthog living in drain pipes, I've seen serval, hyena, and I've only ever seen leopard once, but that was because it was chasing a war dog down a drain pipe. This is the first time I've seen it go in, not for food, but from just pure heat to escape this incredible 
incredibly hot wave we're going through at the moment. You can see that heavy, heavy breathing. It's definitely a nice full belly, which is making this heat slightly more uncomfortable for him. So a sweltering welcome to Lucy in South Bend, Indiana, who's wondering, I wonder if all the leopards are hiding there when you can't find them. Lucy, um, I don't think so. I think that's uh, just due to the heat and the fact that they, I don't think they utilize it that often. We would find tracks going in, but uh, it is a fascinating thing to see. And then how adaptable a creature like a leopard is. It's found a sort of little niche spot in the deep shade. I don't know. I personally think it must be quite hot in there, but it's still less hot than sitting out in the blazing sun. That's why I think Mr. Fatty over here at Tingana, he'd struggle to fit into that little hole. But we will be keeping an eye on it in case she pops out for another mating session. So we've got a slightly funny story. So we got an update from a Juma staff member who's not a bush guy, he's a, a maintenance guy. And um, just before we went on drive, we heard there's a Karula and her cub at Philemon's Dip. Now, I don't think it was Karula, and I don't think that the other leopard was a cub. I think the size difference between a big male leopard and a small female like Tandy is what caused them to think that they were mother and cub. Because if Karula did have a cub, the last place she would want it is where there's a mating pair of leopards. And she probably would be chasing and fighting them if she did have a cub in this area. So I think it's probably impossible that that's, that Karula had a cub here. I think it was these two and just a little bit of inexperience in the bush saying, and the size difference between a male and a female, which maybe led him to believe that. And specifically since James left the mating pair about 60 meters from here on the Sunrise Safari, I'm confident that it wasn't Karula and a cub, but Tingana and Tandi. I know Scotty's gonna go have a look for Karula. We, we left her in a cave this morning uh, in the outlet of the Juma Dam. Okay, we've already got um, warnings on our camera. It's about to overheat, so we need to switch off our camera and go sit in the shade for 20 minutes. So we do apologize about that. And fortunately, that is what happens when it gets this hot. Uh, we will stay here with the leopards till it cools down and hopefully the cameras uh, can do a bit better. I'm just waiting to see if we can maybe possibly jump across to Scott um, before our camera overheats completely. Scotty's just off the vehicle, apparently, uh, having a look at something. Uh, so I'm going to hopefully VM will give me uh, a signal when it is. We've pushed the camera too too far. VM is the expert when it comes to these things. And of course, when the camera starts giving you an overheating message. Uh, and there we go. Scotty's back on the vehicle. So we really do apologize. It is the heat. Uh, one thing we cannot control out here is the weather. So we're going to have to switch off. But in the meantime, we're going to send you on with Scotty. Good afternoon, everyone. And what a great start the safari has got off to with Brent, Viam, and the two T's. Oh, there goes a young water bike just dashed across the road. I'm surprised to be, see it so active. I'm sure Brent has explained, and you've probably seen sweat be beating down his forehead. It's an exceptionally hot day. Even our eyeballs feel like they're drying out. But it's good to be out, and due to this incredibly hot weather, we are heading up towards Sydney's waterhole. 
to see if we can't find any game quenching their thirst. Water holes will often be the most productive in the hottest hours of the day. So, crossing fingers, we'll have some action lined up in the next two or three minutes. I'm teamed up with David on camera today, and for those of you who have not met me before, my name is Scott. So please send through questions, let us know your thoughts, comments. If it is your first safari, we always love to hear from you. So keep us posted and to do that it's really easy you can hashtag tag safari live on twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv now i'm told brent did explain the i guess it's sad but also funny at the same time the report that came through about karula having been seen with a cub where in fact it turned out to be tingana and tandy um, and that's the reason why I didn't uh, end up going looking for Karula because we thought she was kind of spoken for and we don't want to put any pressure on her if she does in fact still have cubs. So I'm going to head back to where Brent did leave her this morning after this and that way we could have ourselves a very good afternoon filled with leopard action. Mating leopards is one of the most awesome spectacles to behold out here. And I'm sure once it cools down, they're going to start doing their thing. And who knows, maybe once it cools down a little bit more for us, Karula will also start doing her thing and maybe go do some hunting. Debbie in Kentucky, who's not a first-time safari goer, has just mentioned that, as kind of historically speaking, and Safari Live has been following Karula with quite a few of her litters, um, so Debbie knows her traits, and often she will only reveal her cubs after six weeks. So thank you very much for that, and it does mean that there is still hope that she does in fact have cubs, even though her behavior, according to kind of all of us, doesn't really show that she is in fact still bearing cubs, but we obviously all hope that we are wrong. And speaking of being wrong, it looks like I was completely wrong about my predictions of Sydney's waterhole. Although, we're in luck. At first glance, it looks like there's nothing really to see here. I think there are two impala on the left, Dave. A bit more left. Yeah, there we go. There's a couple of impala. Or at least one of them. Oh, no, there's the second. But there's a treat on its way down to the water's edge. So if Dave just pans across to the right, we will be able to see a large herd of mega herbivores making their way through this open, dusty area to quench their thirst at the water's edge. Here they come. So how lucky is our timing? It looks like a large herd of buffalo. And if we're lucky, there could be hundreds on their way down. I'm just having a glass with my binoculars. The first two appear, appear to be big bulls. They've got large, large horns and a large keratin crown in the center called the boss. But behind, behind them, there's two females and I'm sure a lot more to come. Although the, the buffalo herds have been fragmented, it appears, by lions, which are giving them a hard time at this time of the year. Wonderful. Well, it looks like the first one's reaching the water's edge now. And maybe a wide shot, Dave, is going to be our best option here, just to kind of take in the whole scene and be able to watch some reaching the water and the others trickling through. There we go. I'm surprised they're not running. I would be running to the water's edge if I was them. Then again, we don't know how long ago they did manage to quench their thirst further north of us and this is our northern boundary so it's not that I'm scared of the buffalo or I don't want you to get any closer views but we can't, can't actually go any further than where we are here but in this area north of us there are quite a few large water holes like this so the animals are quite lucky for now in this northern area A 
And judging by the looks of things, this doesn't at the moment appear to be a megahertz, but maybe it's just the heat that's causing them to trickle in slowly. What I think we should do is, uh, Nikki's found us a little sneaky spot the other day, or at least suggested one, and that way we'll be able to get shots of the buffalo drinking and hopefully some shots of the other buffalo that are still coming down with a better angle for Dave to work his magic. Just a tiny little gap through some bushes here where we'll be able to just give you a different view. you guys know I'm not sure if uh, you got the message earlier as to why you got sent away from Brent but it's because his camera was overheating so so you guys okay you guys did know that so they're still just blowing it <laughs> gently trying to cool it down I'm only kidding they're not doing that but they are just waiting patiently hoping that it cools down so let's hope our camera doesn't in fact overheat and I guess by moving little distances like that it will help just getting some of a bit of a breeze over, oh, I don't know if my plan is gonna have worked out effectively here, but let's just see what we can work out. The gap is very, very small, but we can see a few members in a slightly different angle here. At least now we can differentiate between male and female. And this is awesome. The one right in the, on the left is a female. You can see how her horns don't create a big crown in the center of her head, whereas the other two individuals just passing her Oh no, they just disappear behind that branch. But you can see a far larger crown. And just keep an eye on those three. And you should, maybe I can just roll back a bit. No. There's the female moving out to the right now. So a small mixed herd. Not the hundreds I was hoping for. Not too sure where all the large herds have moved off to. They've obviously got a large responsibility in that they've got lots of mouths to feed, whereas smaller herds, uh, you know, can, can work areas that aren't necessarily as abundant with food. But wherever you go, really, throughout the whole Kruger National Park, it's varying degrees of desperation. It is incredibly dry, and we are all concerned what the future holds for the animals and for the landscape, for everything really. It's gonna be a very interesting few months as this drought unfolds. Hello, Lucy in South Bend, Indiana. You noticed yesterday that no, I'm just gonna move forward a little bit quickly, Lucy, that no elephants were seen and you are wondering whether this is in fact a result of the drought that we're experiencing and yes it could certainly be lucy uh, as well as this heat again searching for food oh that one buffalo's got a collar on the one that just lay down in the water so that's interesting she's being used for research and wouldn't it be wonderful if we could tap into that little box and work out when she was collared how far away but I certainly don't have the powers to do that, but interesting to know that, and great to know that people are researching the large herds of buffalo of this area. Sorry, Lucy. So yes, I think the heat, uh, as well as the lack of vegetation at the moment, as, al along with the lack of water at the moment, will cause a lot of the, the herbivores, especially the large herbivores, to start boxing clever. There hasn't been as much elephant activity around as a couple of weeks ago. It may very well just be for a few weeks that they disappear, and then they'll come back. That's certainly a possibility. They're not territorial animals. They wander wherever they feel that life is going to be best suited for them. And hard to predict, especially in these conditions of a drought, what their next move will be and when, in fact, they will return. Okay, guys, I'm... There's two reasons why I want to move. There's a large truck in front of me that wants to get past us, that's been waiting patiently for a while. So in order to be kind to them, it would be useful for us to move. And 
I've just heard some good news that Brent's camera is working, so we can send you back to him while we make our way to Karula, the mother of the leopard that you will hopefully see mating with Tingana now. Enjoy. So, it, we sat in the shade for a bit, and fortunately the, uh, the sun's gone behind the cloud, so it is a bit better. <laughs> and Tandy has come out of the drain pipe and she's now lying up next to Tangana and she's busy snarling at flies and trying to bite them. <laughs> you can see, even though she doesn't have a particularly full belly, she's still seriously panting a very 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 hard and those flies do seem to be getting the better of her we are hoping for a bit of a breeze to help cool things down to keep the camera cool Mike in Florida is wondering, being so hot, how fast do things that we use to keep cool dry out? Well, Mike, give you an example. I put my whole shirt and wet it completely about 10 to, 10 to 4, and already the vast majority is bone dry. Uh, and my scarf's on its way there. It's just a little bit damp now, so a little bit of respite but not much. At least we have that option. Imagine these leopards, they, can't, they don't dip. There was one quite famous young male leopard in the west, southwest in Sabi Sands who used to dip into the river when it was very hot, but that is very abnormal behavior for this part of the world. And here comes the sun again. So Tandy's not a leopard we see too often. Oh, here we go. And Steph on YouTube says she's fast becoming one of her favorites. Me too, Steph. She's a really, really beautiful leopard, a little bit darker, and I do feel prettier than her litter mate and sister, Shadow. There we go, she's going to go now flirt. Tingana is too interested, but she will literally harass him. There we go. So aggressive leopards mating and lions. She almost looks like she's snarling at the heat. Sorry guys, it's got to be on the radio for a second. Oh, it's got, he's got it for me. See how she's sort of putting her nose towards the wind. She's just trying to cool off as much as possible. I think she, if she could, she could, she would snarl 
at the weather. And speaking of the weather, uh, Scott, he's having a look at some of the cloud formations around, but we will be right here with these leopards. We'll see you a little later. Well, en route to Karula, we just thought we'd stop and give you a view out to the west of the big burning ball of gas that's caused Brent's camera to overheat and hopefully won't cause it to overheat again. So happy that you guys have already got to see those leopards mating. But isn't this beautiful? And as Dave pans slowly to the right, you'll notice there are a few dark clouds in and amongst these white ones, so especially further to the north of the sun, to the right of the sun, there's a big dark cloud there. There's also an antenna you can see amongst a lot of important broadcasting equipment. So there's the cloud cover out to the west. There's also a considerable amount of cloud cover straight out in front of us and further to the east, which has interestingly been changing quite drastically in the last hour or so. There was a very dark cloud out in this direction over here that's moved out to the, to the east, just south of us. So who knows what will happen later, but there is a slim chance of rain. And wouldn't that be wonderful for this perched, uh, parched earth? William, good afternoon. You would like to know the relative humidity out here this afternoon, and I think it's about 96%. Um, it'll, it'll be very, very high. Oh, 26 percent. Um, well, that's the update that I got. I find that hard to believe. Um, but maybe there's different gauges of uh, measuring humidity, and I'm no weatherman, but the humidity is high. It will be very, very, very high, and I think much higher than 26 percent, the figure that I've been given. So, William, that's as good as uh, uh, an update as I've got for you. If that sounds right, William, I mean, it's incredibly hot and humid here, then, then let us know, but I'm none the wiser, clearly. Good stuff. We're going to send you back to Brent's. Good luck with the leopards. So, as you can see, not much changed here while you were with Scotty. Now we're watching these leopards in this intense heat. I got a question for our viewers out there. Where is the coldest place you're going to find a leopard? Where is the coldest place you ever going to find a leopard occurring naturally? And I don't mean a snow leopard. I mean a spotted cat very similar to this, a subspecies of this leopard. Where in the world would is the coldest place you would find a leopard and if you know the answer to that send me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on twitter And the size difference between a male and female leopard, as you can see, is quite notable. And Donna in California was wondering that. And she probably weighs 35, 40 kilograms, so probably just under 90 pounds. And he probably weighs close on 200 pounds, so about 50% bigger than her and unfortunately we can't really move too much maybe I'll go back a little bit see if we can get a slightly different angle I don't think we're going to get a better view of Mr. Tegana but we might of Miss Tandakile how's that Fian? Vim likes it, so we're in the right spot. So Benjamin, who's a relatively new viewer here on Safari Live, is wondering whether the drought will work in the predator's favor. Most definitely, Benjamin, it's a time of plenty for the big cats, hyenas, and wild dogs as the different prey species suffer.
So William, as we watch Tandy pant heavily due to this high, high heat we're having, William is wondering which predators is probably least affected by this high heat. Ooh, I'm probably going to go with the hyenas. They do often use water to cool off, so I think they're probably the best and still then very uncomfortable in this very high heat. So leopard, or the modern leopard, there have been various different forms of leopards over the years. Evolved in Africa around 825,000 years ago. And probably migrated out of Africa from fossil records around 300,000 years ago. And can you believe in Perrier, France, and northeast and just northeast of London, and Valdano in Italy, and about 40 or 50 other sites throughout Europe, uh, there are leopard fossils from the Pleistocene era. So, leopards survived throughout Europe to about 24,000 years ago. So, a relatively recent evacuation from that area. And that's probably because of the end of the last ice age. So Cheryl is wondering, do, oh, have leopards ever got any serious injuries while mating? Not generally, Cheryl. So the reason that mating is so aggressive and the male bites the nape of the female's neck, and you'll probably find the skin is quite a bit thicker there. If anyone gets really beaten up, it's the male during mating. And the reason for this is that the male's penis is barbed and that is to try and ensure, ensure inception. Obviously, we've seen these guys mating over the last while quite regularly. A couple of weeks ago, they were already mating. So obviously, she didn't get pregnant from that last set of mating. So she's come back and that barbed penis actually hooks. And it's actually once he's finished ejaculating and as he's pulling out, it really sort of rips her. And that's when she turns around to try hit him or bite him. And that's where we see very, very interesting behavior where she pops her back legs once she's got him off into his sort of stomach and kicks him off her. But it is to try help make sure that the, the female becomes pregnant. So while these cats do very little in sleep, uh, Scotty is at the Juma waterhole. Let's see what he's got. And if these guys get moving, we will let you know. Well, we're at the Juma waterhole that's full of buffalo, as well as an avian predator that we don't very often get to see. What a great view this is of a gabar goshawk, quenching its thirst in a little puddle adjacent to the waterhole. And I was looking at everything else, the terrapins, the buffalo, the hippo, until eventually I locked eyes on this gabar goshawk. It's got scared off buy some. Let's see if we can't get these oxpeckers quickly above us there, Dave. Dave's quickly into action. Great work. That's what's making the noise above us. And Dave, gr great whip of the camera there that put a huge smile on my face <laughs> because, as you can see, we almost, we almost missed them. And here they go again, Dave. We should be able to get them again. It's almost like they're just enjoying flying around playfully, riding the kind of hop thermals, deciding which buffalo to feed in. How cool is this? And it's not the first time that I've noticed birds enjoying thermals in northern Kenya, in a very hot area where I used to work. We used to get dust devils that would come through. And 
crows, which were basically the only birds that lived out in that desert where I, where I was working, used to just fly up and get sucked up into these dust devils high into the sky, and they certainly were having fun. Doesn't look like these buffalo are having much fun at the moment, but they, they go the ox peckers again, Dave. You're all over it this afternoon. And it's a very, very important call to know out in the African wilderness when you hear that call, which is, reminds me of a comb being dragged over a sharp kind of corner um, or any kind of object, just a comb being dragged over something. That could indicate that large animals like buffalo, rhino, could be around. Let's uh, pan along, Dave, if you don't mind, onto the right and we'll see a black and white bird called the blacksmith lapwings and to the right of them there's a terrapin that's submerged out the water which is not a view that we often get to see so they're the two lapwings blacksmith lapwings whose name is derived from the call that they make which sounds like a blacksmith working on his or her anvil and then just over to the right is the little terrapin. So it's actually not a very little one. It's quite a large specimen enjoying this baking heat and being a cold-blooded animal. Of course, the sun is not an issue. Unlike for the hippo. And that is why they submerge themselves in water during the day. And Maurice was just asking is it because they have problems with their skin that hippos will submerge themselves in the water during the day? And, and yes, that is the reason, Maurice. They do have sensitive skin, apparently, um, and that's why they do like to submerge themselves. So if they couldn't, they would become sunburns. And I guess that is a problem that they could well be facing now because they literally cannot submerge themselves as deep as they would like to because the pond isn't deep enough. They may be getting a little bit more baked than they would like to be, although they do seem to be okay. So it's an interesting one, Maurice, um, and one that I've, I haven't quite wrapped my head around because even though people say they do have sensitive skin, I do often see buffalo sunning them, uh, sorry, buffalo hippos sunning themselves outside of the water in quite hot uh, periods of the day. And it all depends a lot of the time on where in Africa you are viewing them. Their behavior can change. Good. Oh, Dave, good news. Um, the buffalo that's facing away from us next to that dead log, if you just, uh, that's standing up, and there's a dead log, if you just get to the birds on its back, those are yellow-billed oxpeckers. We don't get to see them very often, and look at them. They're smiling for us. <laughs> well, no, they're not smiling, they're actually panting, as are Dave and myself. Again, testament to just how hot it is out here this afternoon. Now, those oxpeckers, unlike the ones we saw flying around earlier, are not very common to see here. Although, in recent months, we've been seeing more and more yellow-billed oxpeckers than in the whole year that I've been here. So we've been lucky in the recent months, and maybe that's one of the benefits of the droughts we're experiencing, is that at least we're getting to see more of these oxpeckers, which I'm trying to find in the book for you. I'd just like to show you a picture uh, but uh, indicating the difference between the yellow-billed and the red-billed oxpeckers. Okay. Good, thanks, Dave. So, here we go. Here's the yellow-billed. I mean, the name doesn't make a huge amount of sense because it does have a large portion of red on it, but comparative to the red-billed oxpecker whose bill is entirely red, I guess, you know, there's some justification in calling the yellow-billed the yellow-billed and the red-billed the red-billed. The red-billed does have yellow, so it's interesting. It's just shifted further back onto the eye. So similar in a lot of regards to its cousin, but a little bit smaller, and they lack a pale rump which can be seen if the birds are sitting at the right angle, which I actually think it is now, Dave, if you don't mind whipping across now. We'll be able to actually see that pale rump. Ah, oh, it doesn't often work out this well, everyone. So thank you, oxpeckers, or more importantly, thank you, buffalo, for, I guess, tilting your body at the right angle to show us what we needed to see. All right, well, I think that's enough for now here at the waterhole. I'm desperate to go and have a look and see where the Karula is still hiding out in a little overhanging 
ravine where she was seen earlier. Oh, it looks like that buffalo is falling asleep there. It wants to use its mates as a pillow. <laughs> we'll leave them to it and... Oh, no, hold on. Let's have a quick look here. It's using its horn. Sorry, it's using its horn as a pillow. <laughs> look at that. Its horn that's under the water is acting perfectly as a pillow, keeping its head out the water. Wonderful. All righty then. Now, just as the ox packers are panting, it appears that Brent's camera is not panting and therefore has overheated again. So they're going to switch off, maybe even go for a drive around to get some wind over the camera. And that might cool it down, I guess, and then return to the leopards to try and give you another little sneak preview. <laughs> well, Paul Rizzo, you just mentioned note to self, don't plan a safari in January or February. Um, well, yes, <laughs> if you don't like the heat, but if you like bird watching and insects and butterflies, then it's kind of a necessity. Bearing in mind, Paul, this isn't a typical January or February. Um, it is always hot, but usually we've got rain to cool us down. And the low fault thunderstorms are a spectacle to behold. But like you say, you may want to think about going to other wilderness destinations in Africa or the world in these months. But Paul, you quite similar to me. I like the, the cooler weather. Zulu saying for a day like this and it goes something like this Likipa in Flans Emanzin which means it is so hot that the fish are jumping out of the water and I think that is a great great Zulu saying now Karula was lying up Somewhere in this kind of cave to our right here, doesn't look like she's there anymore. And it wouldn't make sense for it to be because the sun has changed angles. And I think even if uh, Dave just pans up quickly to show where the sun is, that sun would have been beating straight down from the west into this little overhang, whereas this morning it wouldn't have been. So she would have been nice and cool here this morning when the sun was on the other side of things. But not so much now. Let's try and reposition. She may be not too far away, like I say, on an opposite bank, which will be protected from the afternoon sun. It's gonna take it slowly in case she is lying up under one of these shady bushes so as to not scare her. But even though it has been incredibly hot, it's not unlike leopard to move on very hot days. Joan in England, you've made a hypothesis that because Karula has been drinking so much, it does indicate that she still has cubs. Plausible, most certainly. Um, but trust me, in this heat, everyone's drinking a lot. And I don't have any cubs, and I'm drinking like I've got five. So it's not necessarily the case. I hope you are right. Like I said, we all hope she still does have cubs, but we are all feeling that she doesn't. 
which obviously all put us, kind of made us eat our words when we got the reports earlier that Karula and her cupboard had been seen. We were all like, oh, we were all wrong. But we weren't, not yet. Okay, so I can see some vehicle tracks here, which indicates to me that she had possibly moved ever so slightly from where she was seen with Brent. I know Mike from Cheetah Plains, who I'm going to get a hold of now, was the last person with her. And maybe it was his vehicle that drove down here after she did move ever so slightly. Uh, Mike for Scott. Mark, I'm just wondering, did you have to come down below the damn wall to get visual of her um, by the end of the morning? Yes, there was a, we had a park kind of uh, as the road went through the, the little uh, soil erosion part. Um, but uh, we also found a little gap on the, on the hill on the right that went up on the drain uh, the damn wall. Okay, copy that. Thank you very much. So he did have to drop down into here, which Brent didn't have to do in order to see. Hmm. And these tracks are leading me up here. Huh. Very interesting. I do not know what to suggest here. I think they actually drove through here, but... We're not going to do that. That's not necessary. Well, she's moved off. That we can assume safely. And I know she was lying up in that little cave that we've already checked earlier with Brent, but then Brent left her with Mike, so, who I've just chatted to. So. It appears like she could have moved. Mike's a new guy just, so still finding his feet. And therefore, I don't expect the most perfect updates from him, as it takes a little while to get the hang of things out here. There's a nice Tamburti thicket here that would have been very shady and probably more breezy than that ravine where she was lying down. So I just want to poke my nose in here. If not, which is the case, hang on a second. I actually just want to check something. There's a few water thickenies that have just jumped up. I just want to see if they don't have a nest here because while we were trying to track Karula in the same area yesterday, I saw these water thickenies move from here, and it'll be great if they do, in fact, have a nest. Now, obviously, I have to be careful that Karula is also still not here, so I will be moving slowly. I also don't want to stand on the eggs of that thickney if, in fact, they do have a nest. Kind of shuffled out from somewhere here. Very similar spot that I saw them shuffling out of yesterday. I think they like to their days. I found quite a few little bird droppings here. They're going to be difficult for you to see, but I think this is kind of their hangout. for the hotter daytime hours. I can even see quite a few of their feathers here, which I'm gonna pick up for you. Again, being very, very cautious every step I take, not to the stand on their nest. Now, a lot of you, especially the new viewers, may be surprised that I'd be standing on a bird's nest on the ground. And it is quite surprising that a few birds, Archer, will nest on the ground simply in a very shallow scrape. 
Hey. Uh, no. Well, no. Uh, clear some of a thickney nest. Just a few of their feathers. Nothing very impressive, actually. They're actually looking a little bit worse for wear. Let me get them into a good spot here. There we go. You can see they're quite frazzled on the ends. And maybe that's why it's time for them to no longer be in the bird and rather be out, make space for new. <sighs> okay. Well, I'm not hugely surprised that Karula has gone. Had that have been a lion that we left on a hot day like this, I would be a lot more surprised. But leopards, like I say, will surprise you with the temperatures that they will move in. Some of you remember just the other day on a very similar hot afternoon like this, I was out on camera with Jamie and she, well, we were both chatting about the prospects of finding anything with a heartbeat for the first couple of hours of the drive and mentioning that the chance of a, a leopard being out and about is far greater than that of a lion. And within 30 seconds, we bumped into Tingana, who was lying on the side of the road. And within minutes of being there, he got up and started moving. And no different to Brent's camera today. It was actually the same camera that I'm on now, or well, that Dave's using now, rather, um, that was overheating. Well, Karula has gone, and we will just start spreading our search a little bit further apart from here and see if we can't find any sign of where she's gone. And while we do that, we're going to send you back to Mr. Leo Smith, whose camera has just come back to life. See you later. So, as you can see, since you were last with us, the leopards have not moved an inch and that heavy panting but we are getting it to about that 15 minute mark so hopefully there will be a bit more copulation shortly and I'm sure Scotty's going to go try find Krula now seems like she's not in the same spot she was this morning and maybe she hasn't moved too far with this intense heat we're having So after putting my shirt in the shower, it is now nearly completely dry. I'm wanting one or two spots of damp left, and I feel those are not from the water. Those might be from perspiration. And you'll notice, sorry, Bim, around my head, there is a buzz with how many of them? I can just feel them. I need one now, but... There's 20 or so tiny little sweat bees or mapani bees that are after my perspiration. And as it gets dry and dry and this drought continues, these sweat bees are going to be even more insane. So at least they're not the biting flies, but the problem is if you kill one of them, immediately they release a pheromone uh, that attracts the rest of them to you, so you shouldn't kill them. You just sort of have to suffer through it. They're not too bad in the Sabi Sands compared to other places in Africa I've lived. Now, well done to Carol, Diane and Michelle who got that question correct. The coldest place you can find a leopard is Russia in the Amma region. So I know I've discussed this on the safaris quite a few times and Clown Sharon's bringing it up. So the coldest leopard ever found in, in Africa, there was actually a corpse frozen uh, quite high up on Mount Kilimanjaro that was discovered in the 40s. Now, what that leopard was doing up there, I have no idea. 
It could have been during a slightly warmer spell and it went up and got caught in a blizzard or a snowfall. And leopards in that part of Africa are probably not used to that intense cold. More used to dealing with this intense heat. Now, of all the big cats, leopards are by far the most adaptable, occurring through a vast range of habitats. Uh, from desert, there's Tingana hiding behind the bush. From desert all the way through to those conifer forests in Russia and everywhere in between. And the fact that they are non-Catholic in their diet and great opportunists is one of those reasons. I've seen a leopard eat everything from licking up termites and to catching a baby buffalo. Safari Live, welcome to Karen in New York, who says, isn't it incredible that she can be sitting in the States and watching these leopards live? Karen says she's definitely going to be planning a safari out here very soon. And Karen would like to know, when is this mating going to stop? And how will they know when it's done? Well, Karen, like all mammals, when her ovulation cycle is over, when her Easter cycle is over, uh, that's when it'll be done. It's normally four or five days. And during that time, for the female in particular, feeding becomes a secondary purpose. Uh, the males quite often try to escape the females, especially towards the end of the, the four or five days. But a female leopard is very dogged in her persistence. And also, as we're looking at here now, we have Tandi, who is well out of her normal territory. And I've seen female leopards up to three or four territories over in pursuit of males. Oh, head up. So I said normally about 15 minutes, it's been about 20 now. And during this heat, the mating might slow down. So for definite, we know they've been mating for three days. So they might be coming towards the end. I'm not sure if they were seen mating before that in the west. Or the south, sorry, not the west. Oh, look at that little joker on her. She's hissing, and there's a tiny little beautiful butterfly called a common joker that is landing on, on her head. And it seems every time I'm in a big cat sighting, a joker appears. We had one sitting on my hand a few days ago in the lion sighting. Hopefully you guys managed to get some screenshots of the leopard with that joker. If you did, Pop them on our Facebook page, Safari Live, or share them on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. If you hear that machine gun-like sound, it's just my camera. If I'm there, we go. She turns her head. It's waiting for that joker to open its wings. Ah, oh, and she turned her head again. Oh, there we go. The start of a female leopard's flirting. You can hear the growling. There we go. Isn't the sound incredible? The butterfly doesn't seem to have quite given her up as using her as a, a resting spot. Now she's gonna try and tie Tingana out of that thicket 
and he might move out to mate with her because a little bit earlier when our camera was over he said there we go proper leopard flirting now so as you can see it's over in a matter of seconds I think the longest I've ever seen a male leopard show his prowess was for about 45 seconds so there's a few telltale signs that we can see that this is probably getting towards the end of their her Easter cycle and her mating so as soon as the copulation is finished. She isn't turning onto her back to try and ensure his semen stays inside. And there is a little bit less aggression than in the early matings. That could also just be a factor of the heat, though. And he's disappeared back inside his thicket. A very similar shaped face to her litter mate shadow, but slightly darker and, in my opinion, slightly prettier. So Tammy is wondering, how do leopards kill their prey? Could I explain it again? Now, Tammy, if we have a look closely, you can see the canines, and she's worried with Tundi's broken bottom left canine that it's going to hamper her, and it certainly won't. So depending on the size of the prey, leopards use a couple of different methods. With most small things, they will just use those impressive canines to bite through the skull into the into the brain but with animals like impala uh, and slightly bigger antelope they normally go for the suffocation hold and i'm going to i'll find a picture for you now shortly but so basically there's a specialized gap between the canines and the premolars there's actually a gap between the teeth and what happens is everyone thinks a sort of leopard will rip her throat out. It doesn't. So she's still got three good canines, and even that blunt canine will hold. So those canines act as anchors, and that gap is actually specially designed that it pinches the esophagus of that animal closed and cuts off air supply. And I will, I'll find you a picture of it, a leopard skull so you can have a look at it. Lions also have that specialized gap. A lot of the cats, even some of the smaller cats like Caracal and Serval, all have that specialized gap for the suffocation of slightly bigger prey. Unfortunately, uh, when she yawns, we might be able to see it. So, Kathy in Tennessee is wondering if we could use that bottom broken left canine as an in identifying feature. That is one, but she might break a tooth and the teeth that don't, the teeth can change. But if I see where my finger is, if we go to her whiskers there, and the, the last line of whiskers just above, there's a very distinct spot pattern. And that's how leopards are generally identified by that spot pattern. And on this side, she is, if I remember, she's a 4-3, but I could be a little bit done. I've only seen her once before this. So 
Henry on YouTube is watching her carefully and he's wondering why her skin around her paws and her back sometimes twitch. Now, that is to do with the nerves and it's a little nervous reaction to help keep biting insects off. And you'll notice it even uh, in some of your domestic animals. Uh, horses in particular have a very visible one. And that little twitch is, is, is the nerves reacting to sort of almost being tickled and they can almost induce it without even that happening. It's just to keep the biting insects at bay. And Henry, I hope that helps with that, the twitch that you're noticing. So, a light might be a bit bad at the moment, but let's see if you can have a look at this film. Oh dear, somehow I've gone from a leopard skull to a porcupine skull. That's definitely not what we're looking for. Uh, where have I put the leopard skull now? There's the cheetah. Oh dear. There we go. So, here we go. Can you see it? Was this light too harsh, Finn? We might have to wait till it's a bit darker and then I can show you. Okay. Let's go. So, you can see this distinct gap between the canines and the premolars. And that's the spot that closes the esophagus uh, and helps them to kill their larger prey species. But we're gonna sit here, it's probably gonna be about another 10 or 12 minutes before uh, the honeymoon continues, so to speak. So while we sit here patiently, let's go see what Scotty's up to. So, uh, another animal seeking refuge in the shade, the woodlands kingfisher. You can probably see just a little bit of that turquoise blue tail out to the right of its body and a bright red upper beak with the black bottom beak and the Zorro eye mask. They're uh, exquisite bird. The Woodlands Kingfisher. But as you can see, Probably not going to be too active for the time being. It could well have a nest somewhere in the cavity of this large knob thorn tree. But even just sitting here now, the bush is silent and still. And other than the odd growl coming from Tingana and Tundi, I don't think there's too much else going on here, or at least that we've seen for the time being. Happy to hear that you have seen them mate again. And... I'm curious to know how aggressive that mating has been. It's coming to, I think this is day four of their mating, and it usually tends to become less of a violent affair towards the end of the mating. And Kirsty has just confirmed that it's not as serious as it was, at least probably when they started a few days ago, or when we saw them mating a couple of weeks back. I can't remember exactly when that was, but that in itself is interesting, but I'm sure Brent has been discussing that. Good, we're just around the corner from the dry Buffalo's Hook Dust Bowl. And James Richards, you are very thoughtful. You're inquiring to know whether or not David, who I'm, uh, who's on camera with me this afternoon, got to see a glimpse of the mating leopards, and no, he didn't. Before we went live, we headed out in the opposite direction. We have actually had to put a compulsory ban on quality sightings because you're seeing too much good quality too early on, and we didn't want to spoil him because that would ruin him going forward. There'd be nothing to look forward to. So we're just trying to pull in the reins there a little bit for his sightings. 
Only kidding. Um, it was just kind of through defaults that that happened. That was fascinating. I don't know what just happened here, but a whole flock of birds, like five or six birds, flew out the second fork. Not the first fork, but the, just the second fork of this torchwood tree that's right in front of us. Dave, if you don't mind just zooming into just the second fork up. There's not much to see there. And ordinarily, if it had been a regular rainy season, maybe it's that there was water that had filled up in there. I can't resist. Let me drive the hood of the vehicle up and see if I can't look in there. Um, the Juma ecological team have been doing some work here, building a gabion, so that's what you can see on the sand and rubble around this tree to prevent further erosion. Here's a, a host of the drongos, maybe while I get into position, that were... and a woodlands kingfisher just sitting up there, that all took out from this fork in the tree, and I was just flabbergasted to see so many birds come out of there. I'm guessing... That could be a, uh, a, I forgot what I was gonna say because Kirsty just uh, abused my adjective flabbergasted. <laughs> she went flabbergasted, surprised that I said it. Um, anyway, sorry, I, said, I think this could be a flock with some, some young chicks in it, just sitting up in the tree there. But let me climb onto the bonnet now and see if I can't work out what may have been causing them. It's interesting that termites have been working their way up this tree. So I don't want to cause too much damage to them. I think that could have literally just been sitting in this shady kind of cleft on our left here. Um, I don't know how best to make sure I don't fall looking in there. Uh, it's not deep, so I think they're maybe just sitting in this little shady area here. But bizarre, there was like six birds that flew out of that tiny little spot. Florida, you would like us to go and find you the grey-hooded kingfish again. I hope you're watching that drive, Mike. Um, it's quite a way off from here, and my plan, Mike, is to go and look for some cheetah on Cheetah Cutline. There have been two male cheetahs seen just east of us, so I'm going to check as far as our eastern boundary allows us in the hope that we may find some sign of them. Just gonna ask Taxon what he's found. I heard an update going on over the radio. Uh, Tax, sorry, I only caught the end of that update. Uh, the Uman Garden Trap Pebble Soup just at the northern side of Sydney's there, Alapan. Ah, copy, well done, thank you. Will I get a visual from the cut line? Negative uh, that very far more to the north. You won't see them. Okay, copy. Thank you. One last thing, confirm all five are there. Yeah, positive. Okay, copy, thanks. Okay, sorry about that, but some useful information. Hopefully that's gonna become applicable to us a little bit later. I'm sure you would have heard that. The Inkauma part have been found and they are not far away at all from where we were watching those buffalo drinking. So, obviously, even they were too hot to even think about jumping on the backs of one of those buffalo. But all five of the ladies are there. Well, 
Well done to Marilyn, who's just got a, another bird for the bird list. Well, that was the Gabar Gossawk. So, awesome news and well done. Yeah, I think on 130 something. Sorry, I'm just having trouble with my earpiece again. Yeah, it's not working. There's bits of it coming through every now and then, but I don't know how or why. Sorry, everyone. Just tweaking a few things. Oh, 123 birds. Thanks, Dave. I thought you were like testing, testing, one, two, three. But he was saying, uh, Marilyn's got 123 birds. Oh, I just got Kirsty laughing there for a split second, but that was it. And then it disappeared, which is hard to believe because nothing is moving. Oh, no, I can hear that whole sentence. Anyway, we are going to send you across to Brent's while we make our way across to Cheetah Cut Line, our eastern boundary road, where hopefully we will find two cheetah to add to the spotted cat collection of this afternoon. See you later. So, again, not much movement while you guys have been gone. And fortunately, the temperature has dropped slightly. Tangana has disappeared back into the thicket and only Tundi is visible. So there's huge variation in leopard size depending on where they live. So some of the biggest leopards in the world are in the low fells of South Africa and would you believe it, Yala National Park in Sri Lanka. And this is the two places where regularly 90 plus kilogram male leopards are found. And to take a nice example, that leopards occur throughout Southern Africa and they occur in the mountains around Cape Town. And a big male leopard there will probably be the size of Tundi, around 35 to 40 kilograms. A small female in that area can weigh as little as 12 or 13 kilograms where there's the average weight for a female in this part of the world is about 40 kilograms and a male probably 75 to 80. So that is within the same country, it's huge size variation on these animals. And that's got a lot to do with diet and habitat. So the Cape Mountain leopards spend a lot of time eating rats and different rodents, as well as birds, porcupines and scrub hares. There's very little large to medium-sized agulates in, the, in that area, where there is the leopards here in the Sabi Sand spend most of their time eating dica, stenbok, and impala. So the risk-reward ratio is quite high, and if they do manage to catch something, they've got a stable food source for a few days, whether those Cape Mountain leopards have to keep moving. Now, this is also reflected in their home ranges or territory size. A really big male leopard territory in the Sabi Sands will be about 2,000 hectares, just over 4,000 acres. Uh, a female around, sorry, I, mean, I lied, that was for the female, a really big female territory, about 2,000 hectares. A big male territory, about 4,000. Uh, but on average, the males are around 2,000, the females often less than 1,000. And that is just testament to how much leopard food is in this part of the world. So Jilly, who's in York, in the United Kingdom, is wondering, do leopards ever show any cooperative hunting uh, or do they always hunt alone? Tilly, I've never seen any cooperative hunting in my time in this part of the world, but I wouldn't rule it out. I'd say possibly between a female and cub, but then again, I don't think so. Uh, in a situation like this, when you've got a mating pair, one would hunt, I don't think both would hunt, and they wouldn't hunt together, they would hunt ind independently. So I wouldn't say there's any cooperative hunting in leopards that I've ever seen. Uh, there might be in, in different places like Yala National Park in Sri Lanka, where there are no other dominant predators. Leopards are the biggest, the baddest in the forest, so to speak. And there's no tigers, there's no lions, there's, there's no sloth bears, no hyenas. 
or spotted hyenas in particular. So it'll be interesting to see, and I really would love to go have a look at those Sri Lankan leopard populations to see if the behavior is vastly different from what we see out here in Africa. So I got it. Uh, had a sweat bee in, in my eye, and I've made the fatal mistake of while trying to remove it, squashing it. So it's released its pheromones, and so we must be prepared for an invasion of sweat bees. I actually smell the subject, or the, the pheromone that they've released. It's a very sweet smelling, almost citrus-like. And a sweltering safari live welcome to Cat in Tampa who's wondering what would cause a leopard's canine to break like that cat. And it could be various different things. It could be a fight. Uh, it's more than likely, though, broken in the process of making a kill. And you can imagine a sub-adult kuru or something of that size. You're trying to hang on, and you've got a slight cavity. Uh, the tooth will break. Uh, canines in big cats break regularly. It's not, it's not an uncommon thing. Uh, more than likely broken in the in the attempt of making a kill or actually making a kill. Oh, the joke is back. Oh, it disappeared. Now, Kathy's asking quite an interesting question about whether leopards will sometimes sleep up in the tree where the air is cooler. Yes, most definitely, Kathy. And on a hot day like today, it wouldn't be unusual to find a leopard up in a tree getting a bit of that cool wind. But I think because they are mating, they are very much land-based at the moment. And even lions have been known to climb trees in weather like this in the Sabi Sands. I've seen a group of seven lions up a marula tree on a very hot day, not too far from where we're sitting right now, about six kilometers to the south. Jenny in New Jersey is wondering, are there any leopards younger than Tandy that we see in our area? Um, there's a female I've seen a few times called Shaluva, and she is about a year and a half, two years now, Ephraim? Two, there we go. Um, she comes from normally much further to the east of us, but she is now uh, dispersed. We've seen her a couple of times around Sydney's waterhole. And we've even seen her once in, in the garden of a Baobab camp, which is the camp at the waterhole. And we heard the monkeys alarming. We drove down the fence line, and there was a leopard lying next to the car in the garden. But uh, that doesn't happen every day. And we do often have Karula in our camp. So it's not unusual in the Sabi Sands for, to find leopards in a very close proximity or even in the human habitation that's here. Our normal nocturnal visitor, however, is the hyena trying to make off with the rubbish bins.
Dash. So Kirsten in Denmark is wondering if that butterfly is attracted to the saliva that has been left on Tundi's neck during the mating process. Kirsten, you're spot on. That is exactly why that little joker butterfly was landing on her neck, taking advantage of any tiny bit of moisture that's around at the moment. And that's one of the reasons we've had them landing on ourselves on these hot, sweltering sunset safaris. So while we continue to sit here with these magnificent creatures, I know Scotty has found some interesting tracks and has got an awesome update for you. Two units we see above, it's George here. Uh, maybe, Hello. Maybe. And welcome to what has okay, become a chase for wild dogs, the painted African wolf. We had some of their tracks just behind us. This is cheetah cut line, but hopefully this afternoon it will be wild dog cut line. Um, the tracks were probably 100 meters behind us and moving in, in two different directions. One was east away from us and one was west towards us into Juma. So because wild dogs run around and cover such big distances in such short spaces of time, they could be anywhere, and it was difficult to work out exactly which direction they headed in the end. I'm not sure how many members are in this pack whose tracks were left on the road behind us. But there are two different packs that we typically say. That's not to say that we couldn't find some other vagrants, you could say, or individuals that we have not seen before. They do move huge, huge distances, wild dogs. So, time will tell. I asked the guys who were out this morning while I was enjoying sleeping in and nobody got back to me on the radio so I'm feeling a little bit sad because nobody wanted to speak to me but basically nobody could help me with any information regarding wild dog tracks this morning. Good afternoon, Listen to Brent, he's giving an update. This, this is important for you guys to understand. Well done, Brent didn't do too badly though. I'd give him a, probably a three out of five there for an update. He forgot a few important things. Only joking. But you can imagine when you do go out in some reserves, how it works is the first, the first vehicle that goes out will give the initial updates. You'll go to any mobile stations and obviously no one will answer because you'll be the first person. And once the second person goes out, he gives his route, then the third gives the second gives the third, the third gives the fourth, the fourth gives the fifth. And if you're the tenth person out and you need to give the eleventh person the ten previous vehicles routes and updates as to what's already been found, it can be quite a lot to remember. So that's often why there's a bit of broken down radio out here. But like I said, Brent's a seasoned veteran, that's why he did well. Diane, I've needed to stop the car to answer your question. You wanted to know if it's hot for the dogs to be out running. It is hot for absolutely everything. Like I said earlier, the Zulu proverb, even the fish are jumping out of the water because it is so hot in there. So yes, the answer is Y-E-S. Yes, it is hot for everything. And I don't think these wild dog tracks are fresh, Diane. So don't worry, I don't think they are running around now. I think those tracks were from this morning. Go ahead, Tux. You know how it goes everywhere, but the um, Konzo and Pipeline, Cheetah Cut Line. Some go east, some go west. I've uh, just checked Cheetah Cut Line, and no sign of them 
going south, but obviously vehicles are driving there this morning. So that may be Nyatalile, the Mkonzo, and I'm just going to do Drakensberg, Gwari Pan Road, work around that area, see if I can't find anything else. Uh, okay, I'll be back, thanks. And Mkonzo is a track. Just making sure I can't see any of their tracks here. <laughs> well, Khada, thank you very much for adopting me as your new English teacher, and you said you would be flabbergasted <laughs> if we found the wild dogs. Um, you know what, I've just finished reading James Hendry's first book and I've employed him now as my English teacher and as soon as I've put down his first book I started reading his second book and you'll probably find that that's where I'm good learning all these new big words from, Mr. Henry's novels, which I strongly suggest reading. Um, he's, he's done such a great job on the first one. Having worked in the industry, obviously, I, I, I can consider myself a good critic with regards to the truth and the topics that should be covered in a book that he's read, which is basically the life of living in a lodge. For him, uh, his first book is his first year uh, working in a lodge, and he's absolutely nailed it. So I battle to put it down. Great read. And just like James's uh, personality comes through on camera, being quite a humorous character, there are also a few moments in that book where you have to put the book down in order to laugh and contain yourself. There we go, but Gerda, thank you very much for <laughs> that little joke. I enjoy being teased. I think that's why Kirsty jumped at the opportunity to tease me earlier. So, let me stop here and give you guys a quick update as to what's going on here with these tracks. So I'm going to pull out my map. This iPhone hasn't been backed up in 17 weeks. Uh-oh. Okay. Then, here we go. So... Apologies while I get ready here. Okay, so this is Gwari Pan Road over here that my finger's just above over there. So that's where the wild dog tracks were. We then drove down Cheetah Cut Line, turned onto Central, oh, and then headed back up Drakensberg with a little blue dot now. So I'm hoping to find some more of their tracks coming further west, maybe over Drakensberg Road, or if we don't have any luck here, then we're going to turn onto Gwari Pan Road, which goes over here. We've already driven up in Yala Road North up to Buffalsook Dam and then did Hippo Pools Road to where we found those tracks. So we, we're working this northeastern corner of Juma. This is our whole traverse area, the whole white uh, mapping area, the part on the left, which I'm covering with my finger now is Arethusa. This here is Juma. And we're in the top right corner. Brent, out of interest, is right over there where the crosshairs are. So basically, as I zoom out now, I'll leave the cross in the same place. The kind of central, south, slightly south, but central on Juma. So that's when Tingana and Tandi are. And let's hope they stick around. For those of you that don't know the plans for this evening, it's important that I take this chance to remind you what's going on. And basically, there's going to be a night drive uh, with some drones and some some new toys, a, a, a camera with an incredibly high ISO, which allows you to film at night. How long it's going to go on for, we don't know, but it's an adventure that's kicking off one hour after the safari finishes. So that's something that we are all incredibly excited for. Let's hope our tech wizards are winning because the, the toys arrived today and obviously they need to make sure that all the toys are compatible with our toys and that Everything is going to work, but I have faith in them, and it apparently was looking very, very promising. So that's something to look forward to. Another thing to look forward to is some leopards mating with Brent. Head over there and have a look, see for yourselves. 
So Tingana has snuck out of the thicket slightly. And you can see how massive he is compared to the female. Mass and that dewlap on his neck. And you can easily understand the confusion that people who are not in the bush regularly can have and confuse it between a, a female and the cub. Of course, females do not possess that monstrous dewlap that, that males do. I think we're about getting ready for the next bout of mating shortly. It's about the right time. And there's Tundi. Heads up. Now, guys, there's a very strong possibility as it gets cooler that they're probably going to head back towards Vuatella and that little pumped water hole. That is the closest water hole to this area. Oh, there we go. It's been about 14 minutes so far. I have been keeping time, so we should be in the right. spot for if there is any action that's going to happen. So while we sit here with these very flat cats that are hopefully going to be able to show us a bit of action shortly. I think I've got a little African folklore for you from the Indabele tribe. And it's why the leopard hides his food in a tree. Now, a long, long time ago, Leopard used to be very good friends with Jackal and Hyena. They went everywhere together, and whenever the Leopard killed an animal, he would share pieces of that food with his friends. And one day it happened that Leopard got very, very ill and was unable to hunt for himself. So he went to Jackal and said, Jackal, please, please, I'm not able to hunt today. Please, can you get some food for me? But the lazy Jackal said wearily, oh, I'm just not feeling like hunting today, Leopard. Why don't you go ask Hyena? So Leopard went and asked Hyena if they, he would hunt for them today. But Hyena made an excuse. He says, no, no, I have a sore foot and I'm not going to be able to hunt for you guys today. And then the leopard roared in a rage and said, I thought you guys were my friends, but you're just a no good lazy pair of vagabonds. Yeah, obviously in the Indabella story, there wasn't a word like vagabond. I'm just using a bit of creative license. And leopard kept his word. He said he'd never ever share willingly share a kill with jackal or hyena again and he told them whenever i make a kill i shall take it into a tree to make sure neither of you can get it and according to the indabele that is how jackal and hyena became scavengers and eat the scraps that the other animals leave behind and it was a very sad day when they lost Leopard's friendship. So that is the Indabele folklore about why a leopard puts its kill in a tree.
So of course, animals don't often keep to our timelines. I'm confident it should be quite short. It shouldn't be too long. Now, we chatted about where the coldest place in the world you could find a leopard is, and that's the Amma Forest in Russia. Uh, now, the hottest place you can find leopards in the world is in the Arabian Desert. And we're sitting here complaining about 102 Fahrenheit and in the Arabian desert, it gets much hotter than that, quite often getting over 50 degrees Celsius, which is quite a scary thought. And 50 degrees Celsius is 122 Fahrenheit. And so much, much warmer than what we're experiencing right now. from Long Island who's just jumped on board a bit late on her safari today. We'd like to know, is this female leopard who's mating with Tingana related to Karula, the queen of Juma? And she is. She is one of her daughters from her first litter. Uh, her name is Tandi and she is Shadow's sister. Can you hear him breathing? I'm not sure, but uh, we can hear him breathing from here. I was just going to see if you guys at home could hear him breathing. So we're just going to turn the audio up a bit. Unfortunately, you guys at home can't seem to hear him breathing. And there we go, he's gone very flat again. And I would say even though... I lost my Oh, a wasp on my steering wheel. Yeah, I went behind on your right. Oh, VM has warned me about a dangerous creature. Oh, there it is. Oh, look at that. It's a really beautiful but quite uncomfortable. If it stung me, off it went. A uh, little, little hornet. Well spotted, VM. I nearly put my hands through to rest as I was speaking. And that's why we, we, we like our cameramen. to make sure we don't get injured by insects if they can. I'm surprised certain cameramen would have encouraged me to put my hands there and get stung so they could laugh. It's nice to me, but you don't want me to increase the Wi-Fi password. Yes. So, Vim is in charge of our Wi-Fi at camp, and he creates the strangest passwords in the world that are also about this long. So I'm always nice to Vim because I don't want him to change the Wi-Fi password and make me have to type it into all my devices again. Some of our viewers I think they are serious comedians and Mike in Florida being one of them says with the new microphone that I'm testing out at the moment I could become the next Spice Girl Wild Spice. Mike, you're very lucky you're sitting in Florida right now otherwise I would find you.
and Mike, you unfortunately have given the, the, the ladies in final control endless giggles, and I'm sure I'm not going to hear the end of this one for a while. There we go, guys. She started the growling. The flirting's about to begin. Get, get ready for the screenshots. Rubbing her pre-orbital glands on the trees around. Now doing the same to him. You can even see how much the aggression has lessened since we've been here this afternoon. And she's not doing that very distinctive leopard turn around, placing her two back legs into his stomach and kicking. Now, it could be a function of the heat. It could also be a function that they're coming towards the end of their uh, her Easter cycle. So maybe we've still got to tonight and maybe tomorrow to mate. It looks like he's going to go try to find some peace and quiet. Probably not going to move too far, though, before flopping down. As a male leopard moves around on his territorial scent marking routes, this is when the females will follow, uh, like Candy has been doing at the moment. So now as the temperature's dropped a little bit, oh, looks like she's ready for round two quickly this time as maybe it's that little bit of cool weather. a bit and more and we've spent such a wonderful time we will come back a little bit later and i think possibly we're going to let another vehicle have a chance to come in here standing by okay i'm for just start coming down philemon's dip i'll make space for you uh, i can come back a bit later so guys, we're going to make space for another vehicle to come enjoy these incredible leopards. And you must remember that finding these animals and viewing them is a team sport. So while we get out of here, let's go see what Scotty's up to. So, some great news on top of the great sightings that you've been having with Brent and the mating leopards. Isn't it fascinating stuff? We are on the trail of the wild dogs. And the tracks aren't easy to see, so I'm not even gonna bother trying to show them to you, but they have been coming down Quarry Pan Road, which is the one road that I showed you that we we're gonna check deeper into Juma. So prospects are looking good. It's incredibly thick around you, so it may be difficult for us to find them, 
but at least they are in all likelihood somewhere on Juma and we have got a chance of getting them. The tracks have been coming on and off this road. I'm going to jump out here for two reasons. To move this sickle bush, which is the puncture factory. These spines that grow off the sickle bush are incredibly hard. It's a hard wood and they are the tire puncturers. So best that it is not situated in the middle of the road. So I'm going to remove that. Same time. To over here. Track. I've just circled it. Can't quite see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Dave said there, I didn't expect that you'd be able to see it. I'm just going to check a little bit further. It's not uncommon for wild dog and hyena to interact, so the fact that they're wild dog... Tra oh, here's a wild dog. Tra and the difference between a wild dog track and a hyena track, um, for me, one of the major things is that the two front toenails of a wild dog track will be very close together and they'll leave a very distinctive scuff at the front two toes close together, whereas hyenas, it's not really that distinct. And the back pad of a wild dog has got two lobes like that of a hyena, but you'll find that it's not as angled in, in relation to the toes. The back pad of a hyena is angled like my palms are just almost at 45 degrees, sorry, four toes, not three toes. Um, whereas a wild dog has got a very flat back pad, so perpendicular to the four toes. If only it was as easy as calling a domestic dog. <whistles> Worth a try. Maybe that'll pick up their massive ears. If you've never seen a wild dog before, you guys are the ones that should be hoping more than anyone that we see them. They are endangered animals. There's only about 250 adults in the monstrosity that is the Kruger National Park that we are a part of. It is ginormous. Bigger than some countries, bigger than Wales, bigger than Israel. Over 3 million hectares. And in all that land, only 250 wild dogs. So we would be lucky. Hello to Marianne in Arkansas. And you just mentioned, wouldn't it be great to have the drone up now um, to help follow the dogs? Certainly to follow them, Marianne. To find them, though, in this thick bush, even in a drought when everything is dyed and withered, it's not going to be easy to find them from the air. Um, to be able to zoom in under every single bush where they could be, would take a long time. Thermal imaging, yes, that may help. Um, you get a whole pack of them under a bush together. So thermal imaging uh, off a drone would, would possibly be the solution. But I think it's gonna be the best for following them as opposed to finding them. Once they're on the move and you've got the drone above them, which we've managed to do once, I think, with Andrew, uh, and it was epic, then, then the going's good. But to locate them, a little bit more tricky. I guess, though, the more eyes and ears and people searching, the better your chances. So essentially, you are correct. We just need as much manpower as physically possible and feasibly possible to try and find the animals. I don't know if it's wishful thinking, but these tracks appear to me like they are looking fresher and fresher, crisper, cleaner, more defined. So maybe the wild dogs have got up from their afternoon sleep and are now on the move. just been raised by Paul Rizzo. Hi there, Paul. Good to have you with us. 
and you said that maybe the wild dogs had actually used this heat to their advantage to try and run down prey in harder conditions that's going to cause them to fatigue sooner wild dogs have got incredible stamina and will often outrun their prey in terms of length of time that they can be on the move for so certainly paul um I sadly haven't spent enough time with these wonderful animals to conclusively agree with you, having seen them perform such actions, but I uh, do certainly think that it is a plausible theory. And the interesting thing is you may find that s cer certain um, packs of wild dogs may have in fact used that technique and others may not. I've lost their tracks now, and I haven't seen them for quite a bit, so maybe they've disappeared this way, maybe they've disappeared that way, hard to be certain. A wild spice, wild spice for Scott. <laughs> Mike? That was the best thing that's ever heard. Sadly, I didn't have Brent's volume up. <laughs> Um, Brent, there were tracks going west on Gwari Pan Road about midway along. I can't see any more, so I don't know if you want to check Central up to Drakensberg. I'm going to um, do up to Buffalo Dam and then maybe Hippo Pools East again. There you go. Copy. Will do. But I don't think this is going to be uh, a long-lived nickname, Mike. Uh, for all of our health and safety, I think that we should probably let this one go now. <laughs> but it was too, too, too hilarious not to make the most of. I'm told that Brent wants to grow his hair until it touches the, the, the bottom of his spine. Uh, I don't know whether it's a rumor. I haven't actually confirmed it with him. I just heard some people talking about it. So that's something to think about. You'll probably need about four or five different hair clips to get it all together neatly once it gets that long. It has been growing for a year. That spicy wild hair of his. I cannot tell you what a relief it is that the sun is slowly dipping down below the tree line and below a few clouds. Um, it was frightfully hot when we started out this afternoon, but it's becoming a lot more enjoyable now. You could just something cold and fizzy now would be great. But instead, I've got my trusty two litre frozen water. What I do every night is I fill it up to about three quarters, about there, and with water and then freeze it. And you can see the ice block in the middle, that's all that remains, but it was three quarters frozen at the start of the drive, and then I just top up a quarter um, with water. That's the way forward. Oh, so good, Dave. There we go. It's so cold, I'm, it almost stopped my heart. Oh, but I've recovered. Dave, you still there? Yeah, Dave can handle. Tougher than me. Good, well, we're going to continue perusing through here. Maybe the wild dogs will pop up. Maybe they won't, and maybe a cheetah will. Anything's possible. I actually did have some lioness tracks all setting in this direction, but I think they're a little bit older. But who knows, maybe some unknown lioness are also lurking around. So certainly good prospects in the northeastern corner of Juma. Very happy that Brent is coming across here to help us find his favorite animal, the wild dogs. And hopefully our combined forces will bring us some joy. Why don't you guys head over and see how his search is coming along so far. So, if I'm Wild Spice, Scott is Buff Spice, and James is Hairy Spice, uh, and uh, Jamie would just have to be, oh, I don't know, what, what would we call Jamie? Why don't you guys see what, what Spice Jamie would be? 
So I think the Scotch should be Buff Spice, James Hairy Spice. Um, do you have any ideas for Jamie? You can have a little, little band play on quarantine. Yeah, VM says he's going to sit this one out. He doesn't want to get onto Jamie's bad side. Uh, we could have... Hmm. Now I have to think. So what we're doing is we're helping Scotty with those wild dog tracks while there's a lot of other vehicles going to look at those leopards. So he had them heading west and we are heading east down Central Road at the moment. Also just keeping an extra eye out for possibly Karula's tracks. But I think she has got a kill somewhere in this drainage system, the Mawati River, down to the south of us. I've just spotted something here. Have a quick look at it. And this could very much well work with what I was just saying. That Karuna might have a kill in the area. I'm just going to move a little bit further so VM can show you. So this morning on the Sunrise Safari, we could see where, which was probably Shadow, lost her kill to hyenas. Now, I just want to double check this here quickly. You can see here, something's been dragged. Now, I'm, not, I'm just going to try and confirm that it's a leopard by looking for footprints around the drag. There's an old leopard footprint there, but that's not what I'm looking at, looking for. So, it is possible it could be hyenas. I'm just having a quick look. So, just to make sure which way it was dragged. I think it's going this way. So, I'm saying that because the, I can see the way the little st stones have been moved. Through here, just have a quick look at the tall trees. Any likely leopard tree that does look definitely like leopard to me? It's not a hyena drag. Being out of range. I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting out of range of the <laughs> Spice Girl microphone. But it definitely looks like a leopard drag to me. So what I'm going to do is there's a, another road that just hops off here. And maybe we'll find where Karula is keeping that meat. Okay, we need to go to Scott. The camera broke. Um, we're going to jump across to Scott. Uh, we have a, a technical difficulty. VM is waving a piece of a camera that should not be loose from the rest of the camera at me. Uh, so over to Scotty. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll try fix this as soon as possible. believe it, we've just arrived back at the Buffalo's and Quartz Hole at that fork in the tree that I tried to examine earlier, and I'm going to have to take a closer inspection. Because again now, I had a closer look, and as we arrived, there was the fork tail drawers and even a woodland's kingfisher sitting in the fork of this tree. So, I'm guessing it could be the termitans, the termites, that they could be feeding on. But only time will tell, and I'm going to have to take a gamble here and attempt to kind of climb up here, which could end badly. Anyway, that'll be for your entertainment, I guess. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a little booster chair. My camera box might give me the extra height that I need. Oof. This is risky business. Mom, if you're watching, 
I'm sorry to put you through this, but I need to find out what's going on here. It's a pity my shorts are so tight. They were like Brent's jeans the other day when he tried to climb a tree. <laughs> His hipster jeans. sitting right here. I don't know what the reason could be for it is, especially the fact that it was two different species. Woodlands, kingfisher, there's no termites to be seen. <sighs> I don't know, I might have to call Brent in here for a second opinion as he also continues to search for the wild dogs. Myth unbusted. Myth yet to be busted, but there was in that fork sitting a woodlands and a drongo right next to one another. A couple of drongos actually. Okay. So that sounds like fun. Brent's camera's falling to pieces, and before I leave this area. I'm going to go and just look under. There's a buffalo thorn tree which looks to have some tortoise shell underneath it. I just want to make sure that's what it is. Don't laugh at my Oh, no ways. This is awesome. Well, not for the tortoise that remains here. Can you still hear me? Yay, you can still hear me. But you can see the bones of this tortoise that would have been cracked open, crushed up, possibly by an old male leopard, Mvula, possibly by a young leopard or a young uh, predator that's not good at hunting. Um, hard to be certain. I'm going to bring that along. That along. Uh, what else can I bring along? Whatever was feeding on it decided to do it in the cover of this buffalo thorn tree that I might get stuck on. Hey. Hmm. Oh, there goes my hat. <laughs> Good example of how well the buffalo thorns work. Hook thorns that you don't want to get tangled in. So, I mean, the fact that we can quite safely conclude that something ate it under there is because it's hot at the moment. You want to go into the shade, eat in peace, and the fact that it's all cracked open is also a sure indicator. It's so nice to be able to talk to you from far with the new lapel mic technology. I'm going to hide certain artifacts away from you so that you can focus on the one at hand. This is the first one we're going to start with. Looked like the happy went, uh, the happy, the tortoise went with a smile on its face. So at least it was happy when it was consumed. It looks to be smiling there to me. There's its eye holes and its nose hole there. Little claws on its hand, over there. And that's enough for, for that. I guess I don't have too much else to tell you about that. Whew. Here's the thin keratin, paper thin keratin sheath that covers the bony shell of a tortoise. So it's purely aesthetic. And this was a leopard tortoise. and. If I polish this up, and even if you just look at it now, you can kind of see the leopard-like resemblance in terms of the patterning. Good. Each individual piece, they break off into little pieces, is called a skewt. The spelling is weird. I'm not too, it's skyut almost, uh, the spelling, or skewt. And then 
another interesting thing. We can piece that together over there. Okay. I want to put this down. So this is the rear end where you can see that V. But interestingly, as I turn the plastron, which is the undercarriage of the tortoise sideways, you can see that it's perfectly flat, okay? Now, what that means is that it's a female. And a female can have a flat plastron so that it just slides along the ground smoothly. And because she doesn't need to mount anything. If this was a male and he was trying to mount a female, Imagine how frustrating it would be. Because the males have got a concave plastron, it molds over the shell of a female, whereas a flat shell like this, it'll just keep falling off. And imagine, you think you're about to get lucky, and then, oh, you fall out of bed. Not much fun. So, unfortunate for this tortoise, but I guess fortunate for us that we got to see and have a closer look at what goes on there. Just gonna leave that right there. Not too bad. Oh, the cool relief after that sun has gone down. And Dave, maybe it's worth you while I jump in showing them what exactly is happening with regards to the sun. We may not be in the best spot, but you can see some magic happening out there to the west. Beautiful. So the sun's about to disappear. Just listening to Prince update. Not going to follow up on foot now. We'll do in the morning. Okay. So Prince found a leopard drag mark. But it's heading into some very thick and therefore probably treacherous vegetation. And in this lowering light, it's Brent's decision to follow up in the morning, which I think is a wise one. And half of him is probably also wanting to concentrate his efforts on finding these wild dogs. But let's send you across onto his vehicle and you'll see exactly what is going on. And he'll tell you the full story himself. So we were discussing when our malfunction happened uh, about those drag marks. I'm pretty sure that's Karula and she's got a kill. It's getting a little bit late in the evening, so I'm not going to walk into there now. Uh, but definitely we'll have a look tomorrow at some point. Now, Vim has used two of a cameraman's most important tools that any self-respecting cameraman never leaves home without. And what are those via? Gaffer tape and cable ties. There we go. Gaffer tape and cable ties. What of a sandwich? What? A sandwich. Uh, and, and, and VM says he can't leave home without his sandwich. Uh, those viewers have been, uh, have been watching for a long time. No, no, VM for a small man eats an incredible amount. And he munches constantly throughout the drive on various different snacks and things that he packs along, particularly in the morning. He even has his yogurt and muesli together. So we've just done a big loop, sort of from where Scotty had those last wild dog tracks, looking to see if we've had any crossing the roads. And haven't as of yet, but that doesn't mean they're not about to. Incredibly mobile animals. And I think even this heat will put a dampener on their mobility. Now, wild dogs are normally crepuscular hunters. And what crepuscular means is most active at dusk and dawn. So right about now. They will sometimes hunt on a full moon, which is Tonight or tomorrow, Vim? Tonight, tomorrow, I think it's full moon. So there is a possibility there's gonna be enough ambient light uh, and with the heat that they might actually hunt in the dark tonight.
Scott Scott. Evening friends, um, just to check in if it's okay that I take over with uh, leopards. Hey Finn, make your way. Copy that, thank you. So we've had such a wonderful time with those leopards. And for you guys, it doesn't make a difference, but all of us really love spending time with mating leopards. So I'm gonna let Scotty jump in there ahead of us, and he's gonna go spend some time with those beautiful creatures. I think we're going to go have a look at the treehouse waterhole. So Donna is just letting me know that today is World Pangolin Day and pangolin is one of the most trafficked species in on earth and it is used for various different things. The main traditional use is for love charms. If a lady doesn't love you, you need some pangolin scales. Uh, of course, that is not actually going to make her love you. But Beliefs are, are, are a powerful thing, and one of the, the most important things in conservation is changing those beliefs, so that's why days like this are so important. And thanks to Donna again for reminding me, but she would also like to see one. And now that is a, a creature that we have not seen on the live drives, as far as I'm aware, but not in my time anyway. But we have possibly one of the best chances of doing that tonight. So we will be stopping the sun at set the safari as the sun dips below the western horizon. And hopefully about an hour later, depending on how we get all our tech stuff up and running, we will be doing some experimental night drives with some new equipment. So if we are out after eight, and in this heat particularly, there's a very good chance we might see some really interesting animals that we don't normally get to see because we haven't been able to operate in the dark. So exciting times. So while we make our way towards the treehouse waterhole, Scott is going to show you a beautiful African vista. Well, is this not an incredible view? Absolutely breathtaking sunset here. But we can't spend too long because we've got some ground to cover to get you guys back to those mating leopard. The wild dog, of course, could pop out at any stage on our way there. We are still in that area, so we're gonna make our way along the same road where I had their tracks in the hope that they may be out and about now, Quarry Pan Road. Failing that, we will continue on south towards those mating leopards. So we're gonna send you back to Brent now and hustle along and see what we can find along the way. Toodle do. So wasn't that beautiful? And you can just see it peeking over the western horizon there and very exciting times tonight. So tax guy again. Uh, okay, copy. Thanks very much, tax. I thought you said Buffles looked down there for a second. I got very excited for half a second there. Um, I heard about a pride of lions I haven't seen, but they are to the north of our Travis area, unfortunately. So Jeff in Staten Island in New York is wondering, will it be on all media? YouTube, Wild Earth, Nat Geo, uh, and yes, it will. So be sure to join us. Uh, it's going to be very exciting, and we love having our viewers come join us on really exciting things like this. I mean, this is our, we've had done a few little nighttime tests, but this is the first sort of really proper into the deep, dark African night uh, adventure. Oh, 
Amazon says he can't wait to see what new toys Graham's going to be showing us tonight. I guarantee you, you are going to be excited, Paul. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag just yet. Some warthogs have been wallowing in that tiny little seep. Uh, that is all that remains of the treehouse waterhole. And there we go. You can see. That muddy behind. And Gracie's asking me, Gracie is a regular viewer of ours who's eight years old, is asking, do I have any more nice little African stories for her? Will you give me a second, Gracie. I think I, I can think of one or two. And you can see the Cape Turtle Doves taking advantage of that little drinking spot. And I'm surprised we haven't seen any predatory birds taking advantage of them. Gracie, since the warthogs are here, I've got a story about warthogs for you. And it's why warthogs go onto their knees. So we often see warthogs feeding on their knees. And it's a Zulu story. So from the part of South Africa where I am from originally. And warthog didn't always used to live in burrows. Back in the old days, Warthog made himself a big, huge, spacious home. And... Oh, sorry. Okay, well, we're gonna... Gracie, I'm gonna keep telling the story, but Scott just let me know there's more wild dog tracks around. Copy, thanks, Scottish. Um, I'm at Treehouse. I'll head down towards Twin Downs. So, Gracie, so I've got my story a little bit wrong there. I was a little bit distracted. So, Warthog made himself a house in an old Art Fark burrow, but it didn't have a small entrance like they do now. It had a really big, wide entrance. And Warthog was very, very proud of this exact entrance. So he used to sweep it and sort of lie in the entrance and make himself very open. And one day he saw a big male lion walking up to him and he thought, oh dear, oh dear, my time is nigh. They're going, the big lion's going to eat me. So he pretended that the entrance to his house was falling in, so he pushed his tusks against the roof and said, oh, mighty lion, oh, mighty lion, it's caving in, it's caving in. Please help me, don't come in, you might get squashed. Now, Jackal, who is the, the most sly and one of the smartest tricksters in the bush, had played the exact same trick on Lion before. So Lion roared and grabbed Warthog out of his hole and pushed him to the ground. And Warthog got onto his knees and started begging for mercy. And Warthog was very lucky that Lion wasn't that hungry, but he thought it very funny that the slow-witted Warthog had tried to use the same trick that Jackal had used on Lion months before and decided to let him go on the condition that Warthog from then on would always feed on the knees to remind himself about how foolish he is. 
There we go. Okay, see, there's another little lovely African story for you. We're just going to check carefully. I'm going to head down to our southern, the southern edge of our traverse. And the tracks were heading south, so hopefully they haven't crossed over there. The sun has dipped below the horizon. It is still beastly warm at the moment. I don't think there's any other way to describe it, but beastly. I think it is hotter than Hades at the moment. Are there any local traditions or customs uh, to bring rain? And actually, Paul, there are. Not too far north of here is the land of the Rain Queen, which is known as Mujaji. And that is the Rain Queen of the Vendor people. And various sacrifices and payments can be made for the procurement of rain. But as we move into a modern, a more modern era, a lot of those customs, oh, excuse me, a lot of those customs becoming less and less utilized but still there is quite a strong belief with some of those customs and i'm pretty sure there's quite a lot of people visiting mujaji and she's going to have a, a very good fiscal term this year who's in London is wondering if the drought incre uh, carries on, is there increased chance for anthrax? Most definitely, Tony, uh, and we'll be very careful if we find a carcass that we don't know was killed by a predator, uh, and you won't touch the bones, you won't touch it. Uh, the Sabi Sands will continue to do tests, but uh, times of drought, anthrax has increased tenfold. And Sorry, I thought I saw something down the road. No, false alarm. Uh, sorry, I'm just still double checking. I think it was a diker that ran across the road. No need to engage. Warp drive. Tony was also wondering, at when do we get swarms of locusts? Uh, it's possible to get them in these drought-like conditions, uh, if they but I haven't seen a major swarm of locusts in the Sabi Sands for, or ever actually. I've only ever seen them more on the big grasslands to the north, uh, but it is possible in this drought that we might get a swarm of locusts. Just waving to some guests from one of our neighbors, neighboring properties, enjoying, enjoying the, the long time tradition of the African sun down at beverage. Now, a very interesting thing about the African sun down at beverage when it comes to safaris is there's a very little known fact why the sun was started. So, 
the first couple of lodges that started safaris in the Sabi Sands to the south here in the days when the leopards were incredibly, and lions were incredibly skittish after being shot at for many years. They would run away at high speed. So the sundowner was actually started as a method of finding lions and leopards. And how can you say imbibing a good old G and T will help you find a lion or a leopard? So what happens is that these lodges work with guides and trackers. So while the guide regaled the guests uh, with war stories from the African bush, the tracker normally meanders off and sits a fair distance away listening because at, the, at sundown is when those cats are most likely to start becoming active. So they're either going to be spotted by another animal and alarm calls or they're going to actually call themselves. So the first lodges back in the 60s used to use the sundowner as an animal finding tool uh, rather than a, an, what it is today, which is a lovely way, once you've seen lots of animals, to stop and enjoy a little bit of quiet time in the African bush. Welcome to Walt, who's a new viewer on YouTube. Walt says, do animals actually die from anthrax? Um, he's never really heard of it. He's heard of them having it uh, rather than dying from it. And he thought only humans, only heard of humans dying from anthrax. Walt, everything dies from anthrax. Uh, and the two species that probably get killed by, by anthrax the most uh, in Southern Africa are elephant and buffalo and it definitely kills them uh, and it could kill all of us. That's why we're very, very careful about bones and carcasses where we don't know uh, what killed them. So when we can see an animal has died from strangulation by a lion, we'll happily pick up pieces of that carcass. But if I had to been to find a kudu, which is another animal that anthrax can affect quite badly, lying dead in the middle of the road here, I wouldn't touch it at all. I'd report it to the Sabi Sands, they'd run some tests, and then we'd know if that carcass was from anthrax or the other possibility in this drought is just malnutrition and lack of, lack of water. Andy and Julia in Los Angeles are wondering, are animals resistant to the bacteria that is in the water, like the Juma Dam or the Juma Pan, so they can drink it? Um, Andy, you probably find there's a few, Andy and Julia, there's probably a few people who could drink it and survive. Uh, not many though, or you'd get relatively sick. You must realize that the animals are exposed to those bacteria on a daily basis. Obviously, there is a risk now, especially with two hippos and those buffalo continuously defecating in, in that water, that it can, at a point, actually turn uh, poisonous. But you would be surprised at what absolute rank water an animal is capable of drinking. Meandering, and let's go see what Scotty is up to. Hello, and welcome back. We are just a couple of minutes away from Tingana and Tundi. So you've joined at a good moment. I'm hoping that we'll also be able to show you a 
pretty view from up on the clearings that we're about to reach. No further sign of uh, the wild dog, but anything's possible. And who knows, maybe they'll be waiting for us bright and early tomorrow morning when we get up. Although, I've just remembered that we're not going to be getting up bright and early tomorrow morning. Woohoo! Sleeping! Um, apologies for that, of course, but it's worth it. It's in the greater good of Safari Live because of the extra fun we are going to be having tonight with the night drive tests. The leopards were, just to give you an idea, last night, some of you uh, may have seen them on the Juma Dam cam, which is just down to our left, we've just driven past it. Inga's house, where some of us stay, um, Brent and Jamie and, and Nikki and myself and Eugene uh, live over into our left in that little grove. You can see a little bit of infrastructure there, a little white castle. That's Inga's house in there. And they moved around onto the other side of Inga's house and then down into this dip that we're about to descend into, which is called Philemon's Dip. So they didn't move far at all last night. I was expecting them to have moved a little bit further, especially with the presence of Karula around. I would have expected Tundi to try and lure Tingana further away, which she was trying to do. It was actually incredible to watch last night. We thankfully got an update from Karen and and she let us know that the leopards were there and then we raced out. Initially only saw Karula drinking, then all went back to camp. Two minutes later, the mating pair were back at the waterhole, so one vehicle of us rushed back out and we saw some interesting behavior. Tundi was nowhere to be seen initially, just Tingana and Karula. And Tundi came from, from quite far and started doing that seductive lap dance of hers, lure, luring him further away from Karula, which she knows is obviously the right thing to do. She was trespassing on her mother slash sister's territory. They are both born to the same father. Fascinating stuff. And you wonder how many times that does happen in the leopard world. Okay. We are now approaching Zidip. Where exactly? I can see a lot of vehicle tracks driving around here. So I'm just going to take it slowly. If any of you guys know exactly where they were last seen, that would be useful for me. I'm guessing it's somewhere. Oh, here they are. The camouflage is remarkable. I'm just going to stop here. I mean, from here, you can't really see anything, can you? Well, I couldn't. But as Dave slowly zooms in, you may start to see some rosettes. It's on the right of the road. That's the only clue we'll be giving. That's a bit better. And a good display of their camouflage. And as Dave pulls the focus in and out purposefully there to just give you an idea of how they can blend in if you're not focused completely on them. They blend in very, very well. Tingana does not look like a happy cat. Panting very heavily. Let's get down a little bit closer towards them in the preparation for them to hopefully mate once more for us. Which I'm sure is going to increase drastically. As things cool down, we're probably going to be seeing a lot more of their lovemaking. Well, Dave, you're in for a treat, buddy. This is going to be a first for you after being here. Is it even a week? Six days. Six days, not even a week. And he's already banked some good lion sightings, cheetah, and now leopards mating. Is this your first leopard sighting? 
This is Dave's first leopard sighting, and it's going to be of them mating. He's got a massive, massive smile on his face. He did have a brief glimpse of them last night when we did head out, but that was brief, and he wasn't behind his weapon of choice, the camera. Awesome, awesome stuff. Here's Tundi. She's quite a dark leopard, I find. Hello to Scott Kingston. What a wonderful name you have. And good to have you with us. You would like to know, look at how wet her neck is from all of her, his bite marks. I've just noticed that. Sorry, Scott, I couldn't help but blurt that out. You would like to know, what is it in the leopard's reproductive system and strategy that is so ineffective that causes them to mate so many times over such a long period of time? three to five days of copulations every 15 to 20 minutes, which could be up to at least between 60 and 100 copulations a day. Even more than that, my abacus was a bit wonky, but I've straightened it out now. An abacus is an olden day calculator for some of the younger viewers who may not have been subjected to one growing up. But if we just do a ba basic workout, let's do a minimal. Let's do three matings per hour. I know my abacus was right. Three matings per hour at a minimum. That's every 20 minutes. Three times 24 is 60, 72 matings minimum a day. Sometimes, as I'm, you may have seen earlier with Brent, they may copulate three or four times within 15 minutes. But, Scott, I don't know exactly what it is. I know the reason why they have to do it for so long is to induce the ovulation. So the barbed penis of the male is there to help stimulate the female to ovulate, I'm told. But again, like you say, evolutionary, it, it doesn't make huge sense that it's such a mission for cats to get pregnant. But hang on, let me... Let me think about this. And possibly... Well, what's just sprung to mind is that rather than it being a once-off affair, that would cause the, the likelihood of any male being able to mate with any female once, and therefore any kind of random male could be the father of cubs. And you don't want that. You only want the biggest, strongest male to be the father. And therefore, it makes sense that it's quite a timeless process that only the boss will be able to perform over that long length of time. Um, I don't know if that made any sense, but that's kind of one theory that comes to my mind. Hello, Tundi. Shame, has Tingana been biting you on the back of your neck? It does not look very pretty. It's all moist, covered in slobber. When I look through my binoculars, there may even be a tiny little bit of blood there. from time to time, but it's not usually a massive wound that's caused, it's mainly more just the saliva from biting down. Hello, Mike, in Florida. You'd like to know if Tundi is smaller than Shadow. I wouldn't be able to even hazard a guess. They look very similar to me. Um, but incredibly difficult to, to be sure of that, Mike. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have got any ideas. Um, I'm going to get a hold of Brent quickly, see what he thinks. Uh, Brent for Scott. Hey, Mike. Who do you think is bigger, Tundi or Shadow? Comes either. Same, same. More or less, I guess, probably 35, 40 kilos. Copy that, thank you. Kamakawaida is a Kiswahili term that Brent just dropped there from East Africa, from Kenya and Tanzania, and it means, yeah, much of a muchness. Kawaida is the same. So Kamakawaida is a similar thing, and he says anywhere between 35 and 40 kilos. So that's interesting that he would go so far to to be able to guesstimate that. I wouldn't. I've never weighed a leopard, sadly. Um, 
So I've got, I don't really have the ability to be able to very accurately say how much one may weigh, but I do agree with Brent. They come from the same lineage. They've got the same mother. They were, in fact, sisters. So they've got the same father as well. And therefore, I do believe that they will be of a very similar size, but I can't be certain. Derek Johnson, you've mentioned that you will, you hope with that we're going to be able to see these animals in the night drive. And Dave, why don't we try and get some silhouettes of these birds that are jumping around on this dead tree at about one o'clock there, so people know where the noise is coming from. There we go. That's the arrow marked babblers babbling away. That's who you could hear. Derek, um, you'll be happy to know that David and myself are going to stay here between seven and eight o'clock. Well, not necessarily here, wherever these leopards move to. Therefore, hopefully guaranteeing that they will be ready for the nighttime camera as well as the drone in the sky. We don't want to take any chances and try and maximize this opportunity. So like I say, that's the plan. We're gonna stick it out until the second safari of the evening kicks off. Here go the Aramark babblers singing for us. Babbling away. That was another flock actually to the left of the road, which is interesting. Not the ones that Dave was focused on. But now those ones are starting. So it like, sounds like a bit of an interflock dispute here. Fighting over this little patch of Philemon's dip, they call it. So yeah, Derek, not to worry. We're going to stay here. I'm confident that we should be able to keep with them. Even if they move through thick bush, the beauty of following mating leopards is they're usually quite vocal. So even if they move into a thick area and we have to loop around, if we just stop and listen and keep patience, we should be able to hear them growling at one another. And that way, hopefully, we will be able to relocate them. What we may be able to see, and what did happen last night, which was fascinating, was that, like I say, Karula was nearby. Now, I'm not sure how much Brent has touched on that, but she was in the area, and she was trying to kind of... It was weird, because you'd think if she's going to pay attention on Tundi, then either, like, chase her away... Oh, Tingana's up. Let's see where he's going to. It may just be to reposition or go to the tour. It looks like he had a meal last night. He wasn't this full-bellied yesterday evening. So uh, what may have happened is he may have actually stolen a kill from Karula. He would be more than confident enough to do that, whereas Tundi, it wouldn't be wise for her to do that. Were well, you wanting to go for a drink, Mr. No, he just plopped down as there was too much stuff in the way of Dave's camera there. Let me get the light back onto Tundi, who I'm sure is going to follow suit shortly. I'm very happy to say that there are no more clouds in the sky, which is fundamentally critical for this evening's nocturnal safari, because the special camera that is going to be on, I think Brent's gonna be doing the drive tonight, has got ridiculously high ISO capabilities, but it does require a full moon. And Dave, if you don't mind just pivoting around and showing people that the moon is just about full, but if it had been obscured by clouds, we'd be in trouble. But that is not the case. So the moon is just about full, and the stage is set for a lot of fun to be had. Obviously, having a mating pair of leopards on the center of your property is a massive, massive bonus. I'm just going to reverse quickly. It looks like Alton Garn is on the move, and I want to try and get in front of him quickly. Hold tight, everyone. Little bump. Before he gets onto the road, I'm just sorry, Boyki. I'm just going to sneak past you. There we go. That way, we'll be able to follow him as he comes towards us, which is far better than following them from behind. 
And I'm guessing Tundi is not going to be too far behind. Look at this. What an awesome view. A big male leopard pacing straight towards us. It doesn't get much better than this. Look at his tongue poking out every time he takes a step. And like I say, after a hot day making love in the sun, I would also be heading to the closest bar, and that's what his plan is as well. He's heading straight back to the water hole. And Dave, just quickly show that Tundi's following just before I keep. She's following suit. She's just going to disappear or pop out behind that little green bush. And he almost, he just looked back to make sure she was. But don't worry, Tsingana. You've got her hooked. Here she comes as well. I'm going to keep moving, though, because I want to stay ahead of both of them and not let him sneak past us. And we're going to send you back to Brent quickly. He's got another predator for you. Enjoy. So we've got a really incredible standoff that's happening at the moment. Uh, the hyenas, I thought, might be at the Gallego waterhole, and the buffalo are not letting them go have a drink or a swim just yet. But also, guys, I can hear monkeys alarm calling. It sounds like towards the Juma Dam cam. So have a look. Kruna might be coming out for a second drink. Quickly across to Scott. Well, you got back just in the nick of time. Tundi literally, I mean, you saw there was a massive gap between them. You were hardly gone, but she obviously picked up her tempo, caught up to him, performed that incredible dance of hers. And as you can see, we are back to normal. I'm not sure if Ben's still with those hyena, um, but I'm glad you got a glimpse of them. I'm just going to take this opportunity to again keep, keep creeping back and we're going to send you back to Brent. So, another, a third hyena has arrived. It looks like she might some low contact calls. Strange noises. Oh, look, buffalo coming for hyena. That hyena's skedaddling. Here come the buffalo. As now, four minutes he get out of pan. So there's what she was. Giving us the stuff. Four minutes he get pan. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so, back across the squad. Well, here she goes again. Oh, no ways. They're facing us. This is going to be great. Can you believe our luck? So our little plan of just sneaking ahead of them for now is working well. And I'm sure, as Brent suggested earlier, the intensity of the matings will dissipate greatly as the day is gone. In the first day or two, they will be a lot more aggressive with one another. So that's something to bear in mind. Gonna stop here, let him appear out of the shadows.
Okay, well, we're going to take this opportunity while there's not too much action to send you back to Ben so he can say goodbye and go and have a break before his night drive. See you later. Buffalo has just chased three hyenas. It's continuing to do so. Protecting the pan. We're going to start seeing a lot more of this very interesting behavior the dryad gets. But for now, the hyena's lying down. They know they're fast enough. They're just waiting for this buffalo to move off for the night so they can go have a drink and a swim. But Guys, what an amazing sunset safari, and don't forget we're doing those nocturnal trials. They're supposed to start at 8, but you never know, we might have a little bit of tech difficulties, but definitely worthwhile hanging around to watch. And uh, there won't be a sunrise safari tomorrow morning, uh, as we're prob probably all going to be up really late tonight. Uh, but And then the same program will be again for sunset and another night drive after that. But for the last bit of drive, let's jump back on with Scotty and the mating lifts. So, we've just come back quite a big distance to make space for another vehicle. Evening, how are you doing? Very good. They're just up ahead on their way up. Um, to allow them a good view, and I just need to make sure my bright lights don't interfere too much with them, so I'll get those off for now. Well, I'm glad you guys got to see the buffalo chasing the hyena on. That isn't something we see often. We often see them chasing the lion, but not very often the hyena. So that was good. Well, I'm sure it was good. And I think they may have just lay down there, so let's just ease our way back down the hill. Yeah, looks like Tingan is taking another little breather on the middle of the road, or in the middle of the road. Casey, who's just eight years old, I've got some good news for you and that you will definitely be able to follow the night drive later. It's not for grown-ups, it's for everyone and we would love you to join us. So make sure that in one hour after we finished, you are ready for some action. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to be using some different cameras, getting some different views, and I can't wait. The whole team can't wait, and you must make sure you're there. We'll be very happy to have you with us. coming through from Cecilia. I'm just going to reverse to get out of his way quickly. Because um, I think he does want to come straight up here. And Cecilia, you would like to know if there is a dress code for the night time drives. And no, there isn't. So you will definitely be able to wear your bright neon suits. And I cannot wait to see some pictures that you will have to share with us on Twitter. Um, so yes, please make sure that you send us pictures of your suits. And if any of you also want to get dressed up, Batman suits would be good, because bats, I guess, are out at night. Um, camouflage, some face paints. Anything goes, really, when on safari, and that's important to remember. There's no rules out here. The only rule is that we don't want to interfere with the animals or be nasty to other people. Other than that, you can do whatever you want when you're on safari. You can walk around in your pajamas. You can wear a pineapple on your head. You can do what you like. So please feel free to get dressed up for this exciting occasion. It is the weekend, after all. A dress-up party is in order, and we haven't had one for, before. So, it's time to say goodbye. David and I are going to bunker down here with these leopards and stay with them wherever they go to make sure that at 8 o'clock in one hour's time, we are ready for the drone and for the night vision camera. Thanks so much to everyone involved. Kirsty in the final control. Nikki was lending her hand. And, of course, to you. Bye-bye.